Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Marianne Hensley, and I'm the Executive Editor and Director of Content for the Chief Marketing Officer Council. And I have to tell you, I am really excited about the conversation we're going to be having during the next hour. Specifically, we're going to be discussing how we can create optimal interactions with our customers by overcoming the fragmented engagement systems and data silos that most of us are still struggling with today. I think we all know the frustration of seeing an ad or receiving an offer from a company that's for something we've already bought, right? And that's really just a surface level example of the types of things that are happening on a daily basis because we don't have a real-time understanding of our customers and their actions. And it's clear that this understanding can be tough to achieve, and that's why I'm honored to be on the line today with a couple of people who are much smarter than I am who are going to be sharing their insights. Specifically, we're going to hear about the importance of a customer data platform, and by that, I mean a platform that gives a unified view of our customers in addition to the ability to leverage that view with inline analytics. And it's really only when we're able to put those pieces together that we're going to be able to deliver the hyper-personalized and timely experiences that our customers expect today. So before we get started, if you haven't seen one of our webcasts before, you'll notice a questions button at the top of your viewer. Audience, this button is your opportunity to submit questions and interact with our experts today. So once the speaker presentations are concluded, they'll be answering as many of your questions as we have time for during the Q&A session. So don't forget to submit those as they come to you. First on the line today will be Brandon Purcell, who's a Senior Analyst for Customer Insights Professionals with Forrester. Brandon has his finger on the pulse of where marketers are in this journey, and I know he's going to have some extremely helpful information for all of us on the line today. And he's going to be followed by Buck Webb, who's the VP of Cloud Solutions for Redpoint Global. Buck works with companies in this area every day, and he's going to share a bit about what he's seen and provide some helpful insights to give us some direction as we start to move forward. So we can dive right in, and Brandon, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Marianne, for that introduction, although I do beg to differ with the smarter-than-you comment. Um, that's, that's not necessarily <laughs> true. Um, but thank you, and, and thanks to Redpoint Global for having me and uh, to everybody for joining this morning. Um, as Marianne said, I'm a senior analyst at Forrester Research. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Forrester, we work with global business and technology leaders to develop customer-obsessed strategies that drive growth. Um, Today, I'm going to be talking to you about orchestrating optimal interactions with the customer data platform. This is something that's near and dear to my heart. As a senior analyst at Forrester, I sit on the customer insights team, so I write my research for folks who are trying to take their massive amounts of customer data and turn that data into insights. And typically, I write about customer analytics, things like predictive analytics to predict which customers are going to churn or what products they're likely to buy or behavioral customer segmentation. But unfortunately, I found that as cool as the analytics are that I write about, a lot of my clients are struggling just to cobble together the data from their disparate systems to be able to even analyze it. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So just to set the stage a little bit, if you're familiar with Forrester's research, you're probably familiar with the idea that today we are in the age of the customer. So what we see in this, uh, in this slide is the ages of business as portrayed by the sources of dominance during that time. So in the early 1900, industrial powerhouses dominated the age of manufacturing. Um, globally connected supply chains led to the age of distribution. Um, of course, connected PCs changed the game in the, in the early 90s um, with the emergence of Google and Amazon and the age of information. And today, something very disruptive is happening in which the balance of power has shifted from companies to customers. So in order to succeed, companies have to become customer obsessed. And we've seen these empowered customers disrupt entire industries. We've seen it with Facebook and the publications industry and what just happened last November. We saw it in um, hospitality with Airbnb and transportation with Uber. Um, and from an analytics perspective and a data perspective, what's um, most exciting to me is that in order to understand our customers and anticipate their needs, we're actually 
uh, accruing a ton of data on our customers, much more than we were in the previous ages. So in addition to, you know, the customer data, transactional data that we've had for quite a while now, we also have behavioral data streaming in. We have social media data, mobile data, um, environmental data, and sensor-driven data or IoT data, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've heard a lot about um, already. So customers are leaving us breadcrumbs as to what they want. It's up to us to, to put them together to figure it out. So um, based on this age of the customer, as a brand, we must understand our customers across all of the different channels um, that they're using to interact with us to deliver consistent, contextually relevant customer experiences. If you look at the bottom of this slide, this is the customer life cycle. Cust customers discover you. So maybe a customer of yours is, uh, is listening in on a webinar and they have another browser open and they're, they're shopping on that browser. They're exploring their options maybe through their mobile device later that day. Um, could be purchasing your product in an in a actual physical location and then engaging with you while using the product. Um, through the rest of the customer life cycle, maybe through an app or some other sort of um, online community. Um, the customer journey today is truly omni-channel. Um, and it was previously siloed, and so data, data warehouses were built around these silos, but it's the onus is on us to understand that customer across all of these channels, and each interaction needs to inform the subsequent interaction. So the customer isn't always starting over. In a very sophisticated enterprise, this is what the customer insights process would look like. Um, well orchestrated with every, every person or every piece working together to create a whole that is much greater uh, than the sum of its parts. I'm not sure if your customer analytics or customer insights process resembles that or if it's more like this. Um, certainly most of the clients I talk to have something like this going on. Um, where each person, each line of business is doing its own thing on its data. There's no cross-collaboration. There's definitely no consistency around the type of data folks are analyzing and the way that they're analyzing it. And therefore, there's really no, no scalability. Everything is siloed. Um, and as you can imagine, the result is the cacophonous mess that you're probably imagining looking at this slide. Well-orchestrated customer insights follow a life cycle. So this is a very simplified view of, of how I like to think about the customer insights life cycle. Customer insights begin their lives as data, raw data from accru accruing from customer interactions. Then, usually through analytics, we transform that, that raw data into insights. And this is where you're applying segmentation or predictive analytics to create insights about particular customers. But of course, it doesn't end there that we're not doing analytics for the sake of analytics itself, we have to actually take action based upon those insights to drive value, capture the effectiveness of that action to then again inform this process so that we're continuously optimizing it. That's the customer insights life cycle in theory. In practice, it looks like this. We're capturing uh, customer data from each interaction, again, you know, omni-channel data from a store, um, from a service experience, from mobile, and we're able to link all of that together to the same customer and manage it in a central repository. And then on top of that, we're performing some sort of analytics to unlock the insights. And then, that, and then once again, we operationalize them across the channels and, uh, and take action and, uh, and capture data on that, on that action. So in theory, this, this, tends, this looks great and seamless and, uh, and like it should work well. Well, most of the clients I speak to get hung, hung up here. How do we take all of this data from multiple interactions and touch points and resolve it on the individual customer level um, in enough time to be able to actually take action upon it in a contextually relevant way? This is a very, very hard problem, especially the way that organizations have built their, their data warehouses. And if there's one prevailing sentiment that I hear from my clients at Forrester, it's this, uh, from the leader of a global uh, at marketing and a global bank. We are drowning in data and starving for insight. You know, enterprises know that they're sitting on a treasure trove of potential insight, but they can't access it 
because they're unable to, um, to bridge the silos um, within their organization. And, you know, we have data that proves this as well. So, um, so last year we sub, uh, created a survey and surveyed 142 different um, data and analytics professionals about where uh, their top challenges are in making use of analytics. And you can see uh, the, the top five challenges to adoption of analytics are uh, the first two are ensuring data quality from a variety of sources and then accessing data from a variety of sources. And those were the top two challenges two years ago when we did the survey and two years before that. So the data challenge has remained number one and two, um, you know, really since we started talking about customer insights and customer analytics. After the data challenge, there's also the operational challenge as well, um, turning uh, insights into action. And this is because of organizational issues. Sometimes the folks who are actually performing the analysis are not the people, the business owners are going to take action on the analysis. There can be political issues um, and then technology issues as well. A lot of times the results of, a, of an advanced analytic, like a predictive model, um, are a lot different than BI. You're getting a, an individualized propensity score that's going to determine how you interact with an individual customer in a contextually relevant way in a moment versus um, a data visualization that an executive is going to decipher and then act upon. So, um, so the different technology is needed as well. And we call this the insights to action gap. When, um, when we have all of our possible data, we create insights, um, and then we have this universe of actions, but we can't figure out which one to take. Um, and at Forrester, we've developed this framework called a system of insight, which consists of the people, processes, and technology to operationalize the insights life cycle. Um, so here we start with um, all of our potential data and based upon the moment in which the customer is interacting with us, we find the right data. We have an insights team that creates models um, that are then ex executed um, in an optimized way for the most effective action with that customer with the right message at the right time on the right channel. Um, and then the efficacy of that action is, it becomes data again within this digital insights architecture. Um, and, the, and as I mentioned before, the um, the system is continuously optimizing. The customer data platform that we're talking about today is really the bedrock of a system of insight. It's where you capture that right data. It's where the analytics takes place. It's where the action is, is um, fomented. And then it's also where the results of that action are, are, uh, are captured as well. So I've mentioned a customer data platform several times now at Forrester. Um, we, we define a customer data platform. Um, as enabling firms to profile and segment customer data, including both anonymous and personally identifiable data. Um, that's really important, right? Because, um, you know, firms have had personally identifiable data for a long time on their customers. You probably have a CRM and an enterprise data warehouse where uh, individual customers have their own records and rows um, with PII. But then, of course, you know, when we're talking about an omni-channel perspective, so many customers are interacting with you through digital channels through which you cannot necessarily identify that customer. But you need to know that information because those are the contextual moments where you want to drive relevant, um, relevant content to your customers. Um, so capturing all of this and ideally pulling it all together is absolutely essential, and that's what a customer uh, data platform does for you. Just thinking about it in terms of uh, in terms of the data streaming in from customer interactions, um, there are two interconnected layers. There's um, data from the customer, um, him or herself. So social media data, maybe from tweets, click stream data, like I mentioned before, which is typically anonymized. Um, uh, maybe help desk data from a, a, a service um, a service interaction past orders within a CRM app or, or other, other interactions from other apps. And then there's this kind of ambient data around the customer 
um, based on the devices they have, so sensor IoT data, um, family or relationships data, graphing the customer network, um, certainly geolocation data, where the customer is and where they travel to, um, mood from things like text data, aspirations from, from survey data, um, and then also data around competitive firms and, and adjacent firms as well. Um, this is, these are all data sources that need ideally to be captured in this, in this customer data platform so that you can make the best uh, decision when it comes to um, getting that next best message in front of your customer. And it, and it doesn't have to be a marketing message, right? It could be a service proactively serving your customer. Um, it doesn't necessarily always have to be selling them things. In fact, I would say that would be a bad strategy from a customer experience perspective. So let's look at the evolution of, of customer data towards this idea of a customer data platform. What we're really looking for is real-time, agile, self-service access to data. So when we look back to you know 2010 before, which was only seven years ago, but from, from a customer data perspective feels like ages ago, the speed of the data, the speed with which we actually capture data, it could take um, 12 to 24 hours. And we were capturing it in data warehouses, uh, ETL, um, which was batch processed. Uh, there was very deterministic data governance rules, um, all on-prem. And certainly this is, this is where we had the prevalence of architectural silos. Um, and the speed um, from which that data was captured to, to be delivered in a useful way to align a business um, more than 12 months. So forget about delivering a contextually relevant experience to a customer. Um, some improvements in the um, 2011 and 2013, quicker speed of data capture. Um, we have the emergence of Hadoop um, and data virtualization layers. Um, we have APIs um, to access data, but then also to plug that data into our, our systems of execution. And, um, and as opposed to just on-prem, we have a, a, a hybrid where there's some on-prem and, and some cloud activity. But the speed to data delivery is still, there's still an immense lag of three to nine, nine months. Um, now we're seeing uh, the speed of data in, in near real time, less than 60 seconds. Um, we're seeing data management as a, serv as a service in memory databases, which are absolutely essential for delivering that contextual, contextually relevant experience to your customers, um, and then in memory DG as well. Um, and, uh, and, but still a lag of one to three, uh, one to three months. And then beyond 2018, um, the major shift here is extreme in-memory data platforms and then also cognitive systems, systems that train themselves without having to hard code uh, rules. And the key here is to prepare for the data platform that you're going to need in the future, um, not the one that, that makes sense now. That's, that's where um, firms, have, um, firms have struggled in the past. And, you know, these new platforms, um, extend what you can do. So, you know, from an analytics perspective, um, in 2010, we were doing mostly performance management, reporting data visualization, um, but, you know, the catalyst to, to move to that next level was it was taking too long to get to in, insight. It was very resource intensive, data processing bottlenecks, and a, and a lack of transparency. Um, and then we had this move towards predictive analytics, so more customer level anticipatory analytics around what, what particular behaviors a customer is going to take. There was still a bottleneck here, a data bottleneck, also a um, just insights bottleneck from an HR perspective. These data scientists who became very popular at that point had these huge queues of potential projects um, and, uh, and an organizational knowledge constraint as well. Um, what folks are doing today is they're taking the results of predictive analytics, segmentation, um, all of the data and insights they have on their customers to really drive that next best action. What's the next product that a customer might buy? What sort of service might, um, might you anticipate they need? Um, and then also business process assistance as well. Um, but still, you know, given the overall um, state of data within the companies, there, there are operational bottlenecks and uh, constrained customer engagement. So um, moving forward uh, with the emergence of AI, we're going to see cognitive engagement, which means machines interacting with people through natural language processing and natural language generation, um, and, and problem solving as well. Um, you know, just recently, there have been multiple um, cases of 
AI um, developing software, um, which which I think is incredibly cool and certainly will help um, help to solve many operational problems within uh, within businesses. Um, and this is um, and because of a customer data platform, we're able to address individual customers and make customizable experiences based on all of the data about that customer and, and that ambient data about their their ecosystem. Um, from an architectural standpoint, there, there are many layers to a customer data platform. Um, so you have data streaming in from um, internal and external sources. Um, and just looking at this, I mean, I think it's pretty easy to, to see that it probably isn't something you're going to be able to cobble together on your own, given the, the, that it consists of all of these interlocking layers. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, one key layer here is the in-memory platform, um, really delivering data at the speed of thought. Um, and in-memory uh, data supports the new generation of business applications. It's absolutely critical to enabling real-time data access and to process big data quickly. Um, on top of that, a data virtualization uh, layer to enable real-time integration of disparate data sources um, in, in real time or near real time um, for for analytics um, based on transactional data, behavioral data, um, and it can integrate sources such as Hadoop, NoSQL, enterprise data platforms as well. Um, speaking of Hadoop, um, most large enterprises at this point have um, invested in Hadoop, um, which if you're not familiar is an open source initiative under version 2.0 of the Apache license um, that delivers a distributed and scalable data processing platform to support huge amounts of data. Um, it supports batch processing of analytics by parallel processing very large sets of data, which can run to hundreds of terabytes. Um, in addition to Hadoop, um, the uh, customer data platform requires integration of disparate big data sources. So not just Hadoop, um, but also um, a comprehensive unified view of the business and its customers, its employees, and its products. And then finally, um, on top of all of this, to make it business relevant, um, a semantic layer that maintains the context and the business, uh, business language of the data. Um, semantic technology shape and orchestrate data, and they continuously remodel master data or, or metadata, data about data, for relevant customer um, and business views. So the, custom, the idea of a customer data platform, platform as being an amalgamation of, of these different layers is relatively new um, and, and has emerged as a result of the need to, to deliver contextually re relevant experiences to customers. And so we mapped it. Uh, we at Forrester mapped it in terms of uh, where it is today and its maturity and then um, how much value we expect it to, um, to give to those who, who adopt it or um, or, or create it, and um, so this is called our Tech Radar for Digital Experience Platform Technologies, and you can see the customer data platform is really where you want your category or your technology to be um, on one of these graphics. We're in the survival phase where we've already kind of proven our value, um, and it's starting to, adoption is starting to pick up. Um, it's on the trajectory, the blue line, of significant success. So we think that enterprises that adopt customer data platforms are going to see real returns from it because of its ability to, um, to capture data and deliver these contextually relevant experiences in real time. And um, the, the double arrow within it looks like a fast forward button. Um, actually is kind of a fast forward because we think that in one to three years it's gonna reach the growth phase in which um, every enterprise is kind of um, um, scrambling over themselves to create a customer, um, a customer data platform right now. So right now it's delivering um, it's delivering low value, but eventually we think it's going to deliver the, the highest potential value because of all of the analytics that it makes possible. Um, so, you know, just in closing, I'd say that if there's one thing that's really changed over the last couple of years, it's, it's this focus on 
um, creating a customer data platform as its own asset. And before it was maybe a, um, a leave behind of a, of a predictive analytics project or something like that, but this is a reusable asset and um, organizational budgets are opening up to actually um, provide for this as an end in itself. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And, um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Buck, who's going to, um, to talk about um, their work in creating these CDPs for, their, for Redpoint Global's clients. That's great. Really, thanks, thanks, Brandon. I really enjoy um, listening to your uh, your expositions on this CDP, particularly and and with analytics. I think uh, I think it's probably one of the most important um, sets of things that companies can do um, now and in the future. Uh, I agree with you. It's it's where we're going. It's where everybody has to go. So I want to talk really uh, briefly just about the the company uh, itself, Redpoint. Uh, some of you may not be aware of us. Some of you probably are. Um, but we were founded in 2006 really by experts in the CRM and analytics specialty area. And interestingly, they started the company specifically with the goal of creating a product that could solve marketing's dual challenges, two challenges that, we, that we've talked about, that Brand, Brandon's talked about already, and that I'm going to talk about some more, which is solving the marketing's data challenges that they have. They've always had these challenges. I I picked up a book from 1987 that I've had around for a long time that dealt with um, a survey of uh, uh, CEOs and CMOs with respect to marketing, and the number one challenge was data in 1987, and it's still one of our big challenges today. And the second goal that the company had was to manage, uh, you know, be able to manage complex marketing messages across channels. So we deploy these solutions uh, to, and we support a huge variety of industries, and our platforms deploy globally frankly, um, through our own offices as well as through a partner network. So um, you can see we've got a few accolades there as time uh, has gone on, uh, getting increasing market uh, recognition really because we occupy a unique spot in the marketing ecosystem. So <clears throat> what I mean by the spot in the marketing ecosystem? Well, companies want to deliver the brand promise, right? High contextual relevance across all the possible interaction points that they have. Many companies have unique, uh, you know, telematics, uh, in-vehicle telematics companies have unique uh, kinds of interfaces. Lots of companies have unique interfaces that they've built. But the, <clears throat> the point of it all is it needs to be data-driven. We can't deliver on our brand promise for contextual relevance, really, unless we have a data-driven solution somewhere. So that's why we start with data, as you can see on here, as sort of the foundational capability, the CDP foundational capability. And we connect it in really uh, highly precise ways so that you can get a single view of your customer or prospect um, across structured data, unstructured data, first party data, third party data. It's really irrelevant. What's relevant is that we get a single view of the customer and with that then we can figure out using analytics and interaction flows the next best action at any point which as Brandon's uh, correctly pointed out and which a lot of people um, forget about sometimes it doesn't matter whether the message is your device that I am connect that, that you are connected to us with had a failure call 1-800 blah 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 for help right a, a seamless sort of frictionless interaction with the customer to give them help at the point where they want that help or would want that help or whether it's an actual offer the next best best offer uh, it could be the next best action so um, we wanted to do that and the way that we have done that is we've abstracted away messages, the determination of the right message from the determination of the channel. So no matter where the customer shows up, we can deliver that message consistently. When they get an email, they get a contextually relevant email. When they hit a landing page for, from a click-through, they get a contextually relevant message that's related directly to their offer. Or if they come to the website uh, directly and not through the email, the the the, the offers that they get when they go to a product display page, for example, are completely contextually relevant to who they are and what outstanding offers they have and what the best offer right now is for them. So the outcome of this is really uh, more revenue and less friction. And I use the word friction a lot when I'm talking to customers about a CDP because that's what customers really want. They want this engagement that is as seamless and frictionless as possible. They don't want to have to jump through a lot of hoops and they don't want disappointing um, messages that aren't rele re relevant to them right now. 
So <clears throat> we've got this idea of this enterprise customer engagement, right? And so the, the, this is a, it's an idea that's put into a product um, that a marketing-owned data solution that supports all the pillars of engagement with prospects and customers, we believe that's about the only way to create what your customers and prospects really want, right? The contextual relevant messaging. Um, and so the, the way to, the, our point of view on, on this is that the only way to really do this is with pieces of functionality that, we, that you see here on the screen, a connected data source that is a customer data platform that has all the relevant data brought in, um, analytics, um, to operate on that data and to continually learn from the results of the orchestration, which is the next layer up. And the orchestration happens across a lot of different channels and a lot of different pil pillars inside the business, not just as necessarily normal kinds of what we think of as marketing channels. Let's think about them as, uh, you know, touch points, right? Um, and so when we when we start drilling into that a little bit, as I'll do here, um, you know, the basis for the best engagement solutions uh, is, is really data, uh, and it always has been. Uh, the CDP just brings that to an elevated level because our, our platform solution is the fastest way, literally, to bring in data from any source or service or hub or database. And we have to process it for marketing. Well, what does that mean? It's a little bit different than processing data for an enterprise data warehouse or for a data mart or a simple... Um, one use, uh, one trick pony like an analytics database or data, a data set. We're, we're really uh, talking about transactional data quality and data integration, bringing this data in, matching it together, linking it together, cleansing it, assigning keys to it so it can be tracked so that you can run from a session to a cookie to a device from analytics data and e-commerce data. Uh, point of sale, what have you, and then run that all the way up to connect it to a person so you can start building a device graph of your customer or your prospect um, so that you know how to communicate them and you know how they're communicating with you. And you can drive lots of information uh, about what your customer wants by just being able to do that. And the result is what we call a dynamic golden record. That dynamic golden record is everything we know about the state status of that person or device at a particular point in time. So it's a very powerful concept and we've built functionality that's designed just exactly for that purpose and to do it at the fastest speed possible. So as Brandon uh, mentioned before, there's two manifest ways that companies you know, can fail <clears throat> when deploying uh, analytics for data-driven solutions and working on a CDP at this connected data layer that I was just talking about because without the right product and the right matching and the right integration and the right speed, um, you're not going to really be able to build this engagement cycle that you want. And as they also discussed, the, this next layer here, this inline analytics, this is also where they kind of companies tend to falter. It's one thing to create analytics. It's another to put it right at the center of your marketing ecosystem and really dynamically provide goal-based decisions, provide a, a way to incorporate those learnings, most importantly, back into the solution. So this is where um, we compress in our platform, you know, days and weeks and, and months of analysis into uh, a dynamic learning, right? So we incorporate machine learning as well as our own predictive kinds of models as well as any models that you might have. Those go right in there and they all live side by side and they're used to make contextual decisions about priorities and messaging. Um, and that shapes the message content, and that's really consumed um, by the next layer, which is, you know, what we call the um, orchestration, the intelligent orchestration layer. So the best engagement platforms like ours, they provide this correct personalized orchestration of messages, and you'll see it's, I'm not really talking about offers so much. I'm talking about messages because messages can be offers, but they could also be uh, an advice to, uh, to call your doctor if we're monitoring and collecting information about personal home health um, devices or sentiment uh, from an iOS um, application. These are common things that we can do. And so there are certain priorities that need to be done for the messaging, and it's we've abstracted away from the channel, so we're really not talking about channels so much, we're talking about the best message. Um, and then the channel is chosen through this orchestration, what we can connect to, whether it's an inbound uh, or an outbound uh, touch in, in nature. 
And so we've been pulling these things for marketing and more generically kinds of uh, orchestrated messaging solutions for some time. So our own machine learning is built into it as well as we provide interfaces for existing corporate models or new kinds of services or existing services like price optimization is a common one, right? Optimization routines. So the closed loop nature of this CDP, that means that whenever we send something out to a channel, and I'll talk about channels specifically in a, a minute or two, when we send, send something out to a, a channel, um, <clears throat> we monitor for the response. So we collect the response back from over 120 different available um, channels and media. So when we send something out, we listen for a response. We want to know what happened. And the reason we want to know that is we want to put it in the CDP. So as soon as those, uh, as soon as those actions are taken or the lack of an action occurs, you know the current state and status of all of the outstanding messages and offers that were made and whether they were acted on or not by your customer or prospect. So right away you can see the utility of this because a closed loop platform like this gives you all the opportunities uh, that any kind of marketing team needs to react to a prospect or customer based on their behavior, to continually tune it using the analytics, our own or your own, and the decision about what subsequent messaging is much more relevant, and, and we can do that, you know, really quickly so that you can accelerate the path to purchase or the path to simple attachment, as it were, to get them attached and, and more loyal to you. So we think the minimum requirement for a CDP um, is something like this, right? The, the CDP is usually, the customer data platform is usually said to be like a connected data layer, and we think that's correct. But <clears throat> that's only one layer, as Brandon's pointed out, of a, of a successful um, CDP implementation. You know, it, it is certainly true that correct identity management and quality and data scientist access, access for BI and analytics, that's important. And it solves a, a huge variety of data gathering and understanding problems that, that plague enterprises right now, plague our prospects and customers when we go to visit them. Um, but the wider context of the analytics layer that, that yields real-time decisions and insight feedback, combining that with the right kind of orchestration, orchestration that isn't limited to a single stack solution, in other words, we'll connect to anything in your ad tech or martech stack that you've already bought and that you have there, we'll connect to that and use it so you don't have to rip it out and re-tag all of your properties because uh, because we insist that you do this to make the CDP work. That's really, we don't think that is the payoff. We don't think that's the future. We actually think the future is to combine all these things together and make use of what you've already got in there. So you can see Redpoint kind of sits at the center because that's where we like to be. That's what we built ourselves for, to solve the data problem, um, <clears throat> include analytics and the ability for that feedback loop and and use that to manage intelligent, intelligent orchestration. But at the top there, you see the, the connected um, you know, connected execution cycle there that's pointed out on the right. That piece, we don't own that piece. We connect to that piece. We, so you, you, if you have channels, we'll connect to those channels and be able to communicate on those channels because that's what we do. I think I mentioned casually earlier we have over 100 of them. I think we're up to about 120 um, connectors now to social media, a huge variety of email, um, um, SMS, mobile app push, uh, and other devices, IoT hubs. We connect to a couple of uh, different kinds of uh, Internet of Things hubs, and we have them actually um, deployed and using those hubs and collecting that data. So um, so it's very common for us to come in and connect to the existing infrastructure that a company has, which I, I think is really important from a, a, a minimal disruption um, and speed to to really revenue improvement and uh, and sale improvement and that's what we're all about right increase increase uh, sales and reduce messaging redundancy and make it more specific and you can see at the bottom we connect to just about any kind of actually I don't think I've ever seen a data source that we can't connect to so there you go um, <clears throat> as far as we're concerned that's what we're all about is is tying these two together we sit in the center and we make all this available. Um, <clears throat> across the enterprise. And the distinction here is that this is a marketing-driven thing, so it's really customer-centered and prospect-centered. It's not centered around uh, around other things like an enterprise data warehouse. Is This is a marketing-driven um, solution. It provides um, support for other business 
uh, elements and other business user, users, as you can see here, you know, PR, the quality, the marketing team, digital, um, category owners, brand category owners, uh, and so on. So we certainly provide the, with a customer data platform, we certainly provide this ability to, to give lots of good information and contribute to the knowledge of the, of the customer to the rest of the, of the enterprise. But this is a marketing driven solution. So it's all about the customer in the center. So all of these data sources, we don't care really what the, the velocity or speed that the, this information comes in at it. We get it. We put it in the center in this customer data platform, connect it to the channels and then provide it to data consumers. And data consumers are things like the e-commerce, you know, in integrating real-time decisions with the e-commerce side or the content management system, a voice of customer, survey, CRM, optimization. We do a lot with uh, optimizers and uh, testing and targeting um, tools and data management platforms, right? Um, and we also treat them like channels. The d data management platform up the top, we, we treat it like a channel. We, we, we get information from the DMP and we integrate it. And then we can talk to the DMP using the DMP ID. So it knows what we're talking about. There's not a lot of, uh, silliness going back and forth with onboarding over a huge amount of time. So we use their IDs, whatever IDs that channel has, we use that ID to communicate across that channel. So it makes it really, really efficient and it makes it possible to integrate your rules into one particular place, not uh, five or six or seven silos. The rules about engagement and orchestration are, are, are centralized in one place, so you know what you're doing and you can make the right orchestration decisions using your analytics. And it's probably one of the most important differentiators, I think, of the CDP is where the decisions get made and where they're stored. Um, you want to centralize as much as possible or you'll lose control of it because your data will be spread out again and you won't be able to make decisions. <clears throat> now, um, Brandon mentioned a little bit earlier about you know, Hadoop and so on. And I've, I've got this slide here as a, a reference architecture. And what I mean by that is there's some functionality with every CDP that we've deployed at this point that has uh, boxes like this, whether the data lake is Hadoop or whether they're not quite big enough for Hadoop and so they're using something else. The reality is we're ingesting data, first party, second party, third party data, in, ingesting it at speed, regardless of its structure, Generally, it ends up in a data lake, a partitioned Hadoop instance, um, and we take the raw data and brand it, that is, we mark it and describe it and record it and assign keys to it, and that's all passed to the master data management processing where we actually um, <clears throat> do all the heuristic and probabilistic matching from anonymous all the way through to known and put it in what we call a PII vault. And the result of that is this canonical set of data whether it's anonymous or known doesn't matter. If we know you only at the device level, then you're keyed and identified at the device level or the DMP ID level or the cookie level, et cetera. Um, and, or we know you as a person who's a prospect or a, a customer. So all that information is constantly keyed as it comes in. We don't do it in batch mode. It, as it comes in, it's processed and made available to the engagement database there on the right. And that's where BI, classic BI and analytics kind of reporting and consumption happens. And that's where orchestration occurs by using this engagement database where everything is nice and customer centered and represents the current state and status. Now the orchestration layer then updates all the real-time sources out there that, that need to be there, a real-time cache or real-time, as Brandon mentioned, it in, in, in memory database, a, a Cassandra, a HANA, you, you name it. Um, we connect a, a variety of those as well. And then the orchestration out to the channels, which again, we don't own, we just connect to these channels and get the result of the offers and messages. We get the action that occurred from the offer, whether whether it's frankly display or any one of these other kinds of channels up there. And that goes right back into the data lake and right back in the engagement database so that the analytics can work upon it. It's a very closed loop system and it's very focused on one thing, getting the right message out there at the right time uh, in the right touch point uh, in the right way that the customer will act on it. So I won't go any more into architecture. Um, it's quite a detailed conversation, but um, we've simplified it quite a bit in terms of being able to use it and deploy it and, <clears throat> frankly, make money with it. So 
I just want to go over one uh, quick um, case study very, very shortly. Um, and, you know, we had a consumer products company, somebody who built a, builds appliances in a, in a CPG kind of way, but also uh, had a direct-to-consumer, but really not doing great with the direct-to-consumer side. Didn't have the data in one spot. It was in DMPs. It was in the manufacturing life cycle over there. It was in CRM. Uh, email, in fact, multiple email systems. So they really couldn't get uh, messaging out in in the right way that was contextually safe for them to um, to actually you know do. Um, so uh, there was a lot of wasted messaging and a lot of um, so let's call it incoherent uh, kinds of messages that customers were were getting. They would come on the site and they'd see one offer when they just clicked on a display ad and saw a completely different offer or come from an email and then browse the site and find other offers popping up. These kinds of things are are, are not frictionless, right? They create confusion and, and friction and sometimes really dilute your message and the power of your brand. So. We came in, we deployed a, a CDP solution that looks very much like the prior slide I was showing you, almost identical, in fact, in many respects to the prior slide that I was showing you. And and what we saw, and it's not that, you know, uh, we weren't special in the process. I think we were special in the process because we put all this together. But the, just the fact that they had all the information in one place and that, that, they, that we could present a consistent messaging across all of the channels using real-time decisions to pick the best offer at the best time, literally it, we got a 10x return on investment just from the initial pilot. And we got average order revenue increase of 79%, which is a huge metric for this particular, uh, th this particular com com company. And we did this by delivering hundreds of decisions, real-time decisions per second, um, and lots of consistent messaging going out um, over lots of different channels. Now, I just, uh, you know, the important, I think the important takeaway from this from a CDP point of view is that once the data is there, you'll get an initial lifts that are, that just look incredible. Uh, and it's because you can do things and provide consistent messaging that, that are very, very difficult to do right now. Uh, and as you do this, to keep that lift going up, that's where the machine learning, that's where the analytics and the learning happen so that you can <clears throat> accelerate people's path to purchase and attachment, make them loyal, but also get them to the point, to the buying point with, pro with relevant product recommendations and so on from machine learning. That's how you keep that lift going. That's how you keep uh, increasing the revenue that you're, you're getting from your CDP. So um, I'm just going to hit this one very, very quickly because um, <clears throat> I know I'm running a, a little bit, uh, a little bit over here. Um, but our really best differentiators are the speed at which we can operate to, to deliver in-flight analytics and and determine the next best offer. Um, I think we're the best in the business at this, so we can deliver that brand promise across all the touch point, which is hyper-personalized messaging. And we don't really care to own your stack, so if you have a best-of-breed MarTech ad tech set of technologies, we'll connect to that and use that, which saves you a lot of money on your deployment. There's not a lot of uh, build, you know, burn and build going on. It's really we fit in there. Um, because you have an open ecosystem, and I think that's pretty important <clears throat> going forward. The the days where uh, it was inexpensive to go rebuild an entire infrastructure to support a dedicated stack, those are kind of coming to an end. You need to you know fit within your within the the investments that you have and make them better. So with that, uh, it's a lot of information, but I appreciate your attending and listening. And um, you know, we've got a white paper out there on the on the CDP uh, on optimizing customer engagement, um, which goes into pretty good depth about how this works. And um, and with that, I'll turn it over to the moderator for questions. Awesome, guys! Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your experience with us. It's really great stuff. Um, so at this point, I'd like to dive right into the Q&A session. And for those of you listening, if you haven't already, be sure to submit your questions for Brandon and Buck, and we'll get to as many of those as we have time for. Uh, Brandon, I'll start with you. The first question for you is, how are companies justifying the investment necessary for building a customer data platform? Yeah. 
Thanks. Thanks for that question. That's a great question um, because, you know, in, in many companies, as I said before, this hasn't been um, – there hasn't been a budget line item allocated towards this, although, of course, as I also mentioned before, that's changing. And it's – and I think one of the first things to do is to figure out, okay, what are going to be the primary objectives of this customer data platform given your business? Um, are you trying to grow your customer base? Are you trying to retain the customers you have, extract more value out of them, et cetera? Based on that, you can look at the, da the data sources that you have access to um, to today because the customer data platform is going to be ever evolving and expanding as you um, accrue more data from, from multiple sources, internal and external, about your customers. But given that, your business objectives and sort of that, that quick inventory of data you take, then you can start to think about what that initial project is going to look like. And it um, it usually differs between uh, industries. So, um, you know, I've I've worked with telcos where churn is is really big. So their 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 initial uh, model will be a churn model. Um, uh, in banks, it's often cross sell and upsell to get those uh, checking customers to become consumer lending products customers, whether it's mortgage or or auto. And then in in uh, retail, specifically e-commerce, many times it's around recommendation, uh, rec building a recommendation engine. Um, but all of those things provide lift to some sort of KPI that you're interested in, right, whether it's the retention rate or, or uh, you know, value per customer. Um, I really liked the 79% lift in AOV from Buck's case. I thought that that was extremely compelling. Um, so, you know, so looking at the, the metrics you're interested in and trying to decide, um, you know, what would a 1% lift in this KPI look like? Um, what would a 5% lift in this KPI look like? Um, and really focusing on that, that first um, um, doable use case I think is important. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And, Buck, the next question for you. Um, how is a customer data platform different from an enterprise customer data warehouse? Oh, I see. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question, and, and I kind of obliquely, um, you know, mentioned it be, before. An enterprise data warehouse, it, it is, you know, it does have customer-centric data that's focused on the customer in there, but it has so much more. It has so much more transactional data. Uh, it infer, uh, uh, you know, manufacturing concerns, it's got all kinds of manufacturing data and other stuff, and that's all fine and well, but what it does is it, it, it really – actually kind of bogs down the whole situation right we're we're talking about uh, a a cdp as a thing that is driven by the marketing it's owned by marketing and driven by marketing and so it's tuned to do the things that marketing needs to do which is it's always prospect and customer center all the data is prospect and customer centric somehow some way uh, and it's got to be able to support this real-time analytics. As Brandon was pointing out before, there's not enough time. The, the, the time is compressed between when uh, a customer reveals themselves or a prospect reveals themselves and when you have to make a decision about what you're going to show them or say to them. And so the CDP is purpose-built for, for that, and it's oriented on marketing, and it's actually typically – I haven't seen one that is not run by – marketing as opposed to an EDW, which might be a, a, a corporate IT initiative. To be sure, IT is involved in the customer data platform, but the design of it isn't really to support uh, anything but marketing and the marketing-related activities. So I think that's really a distinction. Great. And Brandon, you talked a bit about how important it is to align around the customer insights process. For companies where data is still scattered or where different functions may be reluctant to share data, where do you start when it comes to securing buy-in across the organization? It's really, I mean, it, a lot of times it comes down to finding those early adopters, um, people who are open to data and analytics and, and to operationalizing data and analytics. And there, there are really two ways to go about approaching these people. And this is more like, you know, personality management than really analytics. But, you know, on the, on the one hand, you have, you could have a line of business that's struggling with a particular business challenge and um, approach them and say, okay, we have a, potential analytic solution to this challenge. Another thing that I found has, has worked is approaching a line of business that has done something successfully in the past and quantifying it with the data that you may have access to. Um, you know, before I worked for Forrester, I was 
a consultant, uh, a data science consultant with large banks and um, working for kind of a centralized data science function. And it was very hard to approach the lines of business and get them to um, engage with us and adopt models. And it, it typically works best when, say, you go to mortgage and, and they'd made some sort of change on their website that impacted the customer experience. And we could actually show that from um, from both behavioral and, and customer feedback data that this, this was a net positive effect. And, um, and showing that story to them um, got their buy-in because we said, look, you know, you've done something very well here, and we have an opportunity to, to replicate that right now in a different way. Um, people like to have their, their horns tooted, I found. Um, so that's another way to do that. <laughs> Great. And then, Buck, um, when it comes to the customer data platform, on how granular of a level are you able to look at geolocation and take action based on location? Yep, that's a great question. In fact, I love this question. And I'm going to conflate this uh, geolocation and weather. They're kind of related things where there's an environmental uh, you know, location question, and you want to be able to take action uh, you based on that. And I'll, I'll give you uh, an example. So let's forget about beacons where you, you where you, you know, you break through a, a, a geofence or something. We, we obviously can, can do that, and, and, and then the CDP can push a, a push an offer either through their mobile app if they've got an app that, that allows that or a notification, right, to it if they allow that. So uh, it's certainly capable of doing that, and, be, and the reason it's capable of doing it because it has that real-time component, right? So you pull up, uh, you pull up in the in the parking lot. You know we can make sure that a mobile push gets there to let you know that. Uh, well, let's fill in the blank. Purses are on sale today. Would you like to buy? You know, purses are on sale. Don't you know? Make sure to to stop in and see us. That kind of thing. Um, but there's even more generalized stuff that you can do. And um, you know, one of our customers has an appliance and more than one appliance. But we'll talk about one appliance. And it's really interesting for them. For the quality of their of their product, um, and for for customers to regularly replace their filter, so we have a geography overlay that shows where well locations are. This is a commonly known kind of piece of information that you can get, and so it's really more critical for people who are on well water to replace their filters at a regular schedule and so on. If we know when they bought the last filter and we know they're they're in a, a well water propensity region then periodically we remind them. So, again, it's at that frictionless interaction, um, and that's just one example, but there's many examples. We can get, obviously, geolocation estimates from um, from <clears throat> session and cookie data, from the web analytics piece, and from other things, from mobile apps. And so you can use those to your advantage if you're in that kind of business to make sure that you have that relationship with your customer and that it uh, continues and it's frictionless. Um, same thing with weather. If you've got a weather... If you're if you're selling weather related product or some of your product is weather related, knowing that there's a big storm coming to Boston, uh, you know, according to the weather forecast, is a really good thing to know, especially if you know it a couple of days in advance and you know that your um, warehouses there have adequate supply to send an offer out there to say, would you like this? I can have this in your house tomorrow, right? Whatever this thing is, wherever that product is related to cold weather, because you know cold weather consumption dries up consumption of this particular product. So those are real-life things that we're doing right now with customers via CDP. Perfect. Thank you. And, Brandon, um, you mentioned that one area where breakdowns tend to occur for companies is when insights should be operationalized across channels. Why do you think this is such a challenge for many companies, and where do you think organizations need to start when it comes to overcoming some of those technology and internal hurdles that keep them from being able to act on those insights? Mm. Yeah, well, and once again, if we if we look at the example of a bank, you know, a bank typically has customer data um, warehouses that have been built up around the different products that it offers. So there's probably a database of checking customers and a database of mortgage customers, auto finance, uh, student loan, et cetera. Um, and those databases historically don't talk to each other, even though they contain a lot of the same customers. And to be able to do a cross-sell model, like I mentioned before, you have to be able to find which, which of your checking customers have actually um, uh, purchased a consumer lending product 
which means, you know, um, integrating those data sources um, together. And that's really what, um, you know, that's really the impetus for a customer data platform is to be able to tie those customer records together, create, as Buck mentioned in his slides, a golden record on each customer that looks across products and across channels as well, from ATM to phone to in the, the bank itself, to be able to deliver those, um, those contextually relevant experiences. Great. And we have time for one more question. So, Buck, I'll leave this one for you. Um, for companies that may just be getting started on this journey, what do you think are the key steps that listeners today can take to begin working toward the adoption and implementation of a customer data platform? And who really need to be their key partners in making that process successful? Well, that's a that's a good question too. Brandon kind of alluded to the key point before, and sort of what our customers have found uh, is the best way to do this, and that is when you're thinking about starting down the CDP route, um, make sure that you know what metric it is that you're out to increase. Make sure that you define what kinds of pieces of information that is data streams or or in the martech ad space ad tech space what kinds of channels it is that you need to have to make this successful and go for that first you don't have to pull in all 150 or 1700 data sources or whatever your whatever your account is the real key is to get started but get started with a measurable thing that's going to give you sorry that's going to give you um uh, you know, really high quality return on it, um, and we we've seen customers do that where where they say, okay, we're going to put you guys in, but we're going to give you the five toughest campaigns that these are the things that we used to dream about that we can do now. We're going to give those to you so that we can discreetly measure the incremental revenue that we would that we would get from your CDP. So that's what we're going to tackle first is things that might be low hanging fruit, but they represent new incremental revenue, accretive revenue, um, and that can be attributed to the CDP so that you know that you're getting value. Um, now, as far as the partners are concerned, besides uh, internally, you know, besides for the CMO, the IT uh, partner, you just need to, need to make sure um, that when you that you that when you engage with anyone, including us, you know, the idea for the picking the correct partner is make sure that they've got this analytics tied in very, very nicely to the data and to the orchestration and that they can respond in the time frame. That is to make sh that is to say, make sure that decisions can be rendered in the time frame that you need them because that's the hardest part. It's something we do very well, but that's kind of the trickiest part is to get that, uh, get that out there and get those decisions orchestrated and rendered. We make it easy to do, but it's a lot harder to do than you might think. So that's the number one, you know, cautionary know what I'd give you there. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, it looks like that is all of the time that we have for today. So to those of you who are listening in, thank you very much for taking the time to join us and submitting your questions for our speakers. If you joined us late or if you'd like to share this webcast with your colleagues, the same link you used to register can also be used to view the on-demand version, which will be available immediately following the live recording. So Brandon and Buck, thank you both again for being here today and for sharing your insights with us. And until next time, thank you all from the CMO Council, and I hope you'll join us again for another webinar soon. Thank you.